Ian Lee's Galloway has the call. He has almost his full time remaining, should he wish to avail himself of that opportunity. Speaker. Ian Lee's Galloway. Um, Mr. Speaker, back in 19... Back in 1978... Uh, <laughs> yes, it's a, it's a little loud. Yeah, hi. How are you? Um, back in 1978, a, uh, a couple uh, who had been um, struggling for close to nine years uh, to conceive um, were, yeah, were, um, were blessed with the arrival of a, of a wee baby, uh, and um, that baby was me, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it was after, after nine years. It was called by some people a miracle that uh, my parents were able to conceive, and that I was to arrive. I, I prefer to think of it as, a, as an interesting series of events. Um, coincidentally. Only a few months earlier than that, in 1978, another couple, Leslie and John Brown, who had been struggling to conceive, uh, gave birth to a wee baby girl, Louise Brown. And Louise Brown was the first, uh, what was called at the time, test tube baby, the first baby born uh, through in vitro uh, fertilisation. Uh, and that was, Mr Speaker, just a little more than 30 years ago. In the time since then, uh, the, uh, the technology... Uh, and the number of people uh, using in vitro fertilisation has grown and developed considerably. And it was in response to that uh, that in 2004 the Labour government at the time uh, introduced the Human Assisted Reproductive Technology Bill. Um, the, uh, the bill that we are um, finalising tonight is a, is a slight amendment to that bill uh, that makes some, some minor adjustments in response to, to a legal opinion that was concerned with the storage limits applying to uh, gametes and embryos. The current uh, reading of the, the current legal reading of the of the of the Act as it stands uh, suggests that uh, those gametes and embryos that were stored before the bill was introduced would also have a 10-year period applied to them. Uh, and that they would need to uh, be destroyed within 10 years of, of their original storage, which was not uh, the intention of Parliament at the time and wasn't the intention of the bill. Uh, and uh, when you're dealing with these sensitive uh, situations with a couple who are trying to conceive, even when they uh, engage in, in using in vitro uh, fertilisation technology, that process can still be very difficult. Uh, and so it's very, very important that we here in Parliament are absolutely clear about what the intention and, in fact, what the practical applications of a piece of legislation uh, is in, in that situation. And that's why uh, this bill, I think, has um, received near unanimous support through the House and, and certainly the opposition uh, parties uh, on this side of the House will continue to support it. Uh, the, um, and the amendment... Uh, now ensures that the 10-year storage limit starts from 2004 uh, when the original bill was first introduced. And that uh, is to ensure that there is fairness and equity and, and clear understanding for those people uh, who did store uh, sperm or eggs or, um, uh, or uh, embryos before the bill uh, originally came into, uh, into force. These days, around 2% uh, of babies in New Zealand uh, conceive through some form of reproductive assistance. Uh, and the number of babies born as a result of assisted reproductive technology has actually grown by 45%, or it grew between, uh, by 45% between 2004 and 2008. And that is why in that environment of a rapidly um, changing technology and rapid uptake of this technology that we need to make sure we uh, get the, te the uh, legislation right. And I understand uh, that to date something of the order of 4 million babies um, have been born since Louise Brown was first born back in 1978. Around 4 million babies have been born uh, through uh, in vitro uh, fertilisation technology. Uh, the, uh, the, the, amendments, uh, the amendment bill actually makes a couple of other uh, changes. Some of those uh, were raised with the Health Select Committee uh, during the, uh, in the submissions made to the, uh, to the committee. Uh, one of those is around uh, the, um, the, the requirement for fertility clinics uh, in, in terms of how they dispose 
uh, of gametes or embryos, and uh, the, um, one of the submissions did raise the question of whether fer fertility clinics would be required to destroy every single uh, gamete or embryo exactly on the 10th anniversary of their original storage. Uh, and, and raised some of the, the issues around that and the difficulty that fertility clinics would have in doing that. And I think quite sensibly the House has adopted a provision uh, to give a six-month grace period uh, whereby uh, fertility clinics will have six months following the anniversary of the original storage within which to uh, dispose uh, of the gametes and embryos. And that makes sense. That means that they can do it maybe two or three times a year. They can go through that process uh, and that just makes life a, a little simpler for them. The same submission actually raised a few issues as well around the possibility of extending uh, the period beyond 10 years. And this will arise for a number of people, especially those uh, who store their gametes at, at a very, very early stage in life. Some example of those are young men uh, who are undertaking cancer treatment, who, who may uh, want to store their sperm before they undertake that treatment uh, to ensure against any damage that may occur during chemotherapy. They may do that at a very early period of life and after 10 years may still not be in a position or be comfortable with starting a family but may wish to do that further on down the track. And um, the Ethics uh, Committee uh, will have the, uh, the uh, means available to them to extend that in those type of circumstances. But, it, but the bill also makes it very clear uh, that, those, that the nature of those circumstances must be looked at very carefully uh, and that the reasons for extending beyond the, t the 10-year period have to be justified. Uh, and, and an example like I just gave is uh, a valid justification for that. Uh, another one which may not be uh, and which was suggested to the Health Select Committee is, for instance, if someone decided to engage in a, a series of risky behaviours, uh, particularly um, maybe drug taking or other behaviours which may uh, lower their own fertility, uh, having sort of insured against that type of behaviour would not be a good reason for extending beyond the 10-year period. Uh, and the bill also <clears throat> makes that uh, very clear, or at least, at least it, it gives guidelines, and, and the guidelines are clear for the ethics committees in terms of, of what they need to do uh, in dealing with that. And Mr. Speaker, this is, this is all about clarity, and that's, that's the important part of this uh, bill. What is important to recognise, I think, though, is that um, uh, for such a difficult area, uh, such a sensitive area and, uh, and dealing with uh, rapidly changing technologies. The original bill was a very strong bill and the fact that we are, are amending it in such minor ways I think speaks volumes about the original drafting of the bill uh, and the original uh, proponent of the bill, uh, Di Yates, who did a, a superb job back in 2003 and 2004 in progressing a good piece of legislation. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, this, um, this, this bill will, will tidy those things up it will give certainty uh, to the families uh, who uh, will be operating within the bounds of this bill, as well as, of course, the clinicians operating within the bounds of this bill, and the opposition is very happy to support its progress. Well, I'll give the call to the Honourable Steve Chadwick.